Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Um, anyone wasn't there Friday? Okay, so last Friday, we also received the announcement, right? I sat down this morning. Did not see it, but I didn't check. <coughs> the exam is Wednesday. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's about the career showcase. <laughs> so, uh, so, you got me. <laughs> uh, what did I do once? I don't remember. One time it was in April full time. It was a student for the for that part of us. What'd you uh, do? Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I, I was like saying that I was really bad at the exam. I was returning the exam and I didn't think it was fun. <coughs> usually exams are pretty good in those classes. So, okay, sorry. Um, so last time we talked about uh, some characteristics of shipments with pharmaceutical products. Um, we discuss large volume, usually they, all, they use their own thing, all system and containers, so therefore they're active, so we don't have to worry too much about this. But the small volume shipments, uh, where you ship to um, pharmacies, okay, uh, us, okay, or hospital, doctor's office, oftentimes these will be shipped with regular FedEx UPS and without any temperature control. So we mentioned that we need to design a packaging system that will help maintain the temperature during those times. And that was pretty challenging. You guys remember what the concept of the last mile was? It's like when you drop off the package at the front desk or something. Okay, so it's when it's delivered. And what is challenging about this? This stuff is about to expire. I'm sorry? Because like the cooling system is about to, okay. everything's about to fail. Um, it could sit there in the sun for yeah, or well, yeah, so obviously it can be the cold or the sun, but we often think about the, the, the sun, and that's right, so it can be pretty challenging um, during that time. So, very good. Uh, remember this, this would be, this could be a question I may ask. It's, obviously, it's not described in detail, and we spend time discussing it, so, and it's an orange, <laughs> and it's an orange, it's important, okay? So you should understand what is the concept of the last month. Uh, and again, if you if you are too shy to ask again what it is, don't worry. Before the exam, I'll do a review session in okay, of all the things, and we'll cover that. Or you can come and see me. Or you know. So we discussed a bunch of things, a uh, bunch of factors that are important to think about during the design, okay? And uh, we presented some of the main components and what the options are. Um, I forgot to mention something last time, uh, and I guess I talked about it, but I didn't explain it too much. Um, remember in the box I showed you, I mentioned they, they use natural convection, because they had tried to blanket the thing. So in here, this box, okay, obviously this is a schematic, but you have the thermal buffers. Okay, remember these will be facing material that will be used to usually prevent the load from <coughs> freezing. And on top here, and you said it's blue, I think it's gold, obviously. Um, typically, you may have a frozen pack at the top. Okay. So, what do you, why do you think you put the frozen pack at the top? Because hot air rises. Okay, so to kind of make use to of natural convection. 
do you see a flaw with this design? What is the assumption here? That it doesn't condense at the top and it falls back. No, it's probably going to condense. Yes. Exactly. Okay. So you are assuming that whatever little arrows that you see like this on the package, that this is going to be respected, which is not usually not going to be the case for different reasons. Obviously, we've seen pictures with air transportation, with the box, whatever the orientation is, you're going to fit it this way. Um, other than that, a lot of times, I remember like a regular journey through like a FedEx shipment, your box is going to be flipped about 25 times, okay? And typically conveyors and other automated systems don't really care about this. Okay. So, um, so that's one thing that if you, you cannot necessarily rely on a certain orientation for you. Okay. Uh, if you do, and if it's flipped back, then you may have actually that comb that is accumulated at the bottom and does not do what it's supposed to be doing. So uh, straightforward, but something to think about. Okay. So I'm now I'm not gonna go back and revise all of these things. This is where we discuss the different components, okay? Uh, what they are from, some kind of ranges and prices, and we finished with that table here, I think. Um, that was comparing the different things. I mentioned you don't have to remember this. This is there as a source of information for you. So some basic design principles here. So one of the things that will work best is really to try to surround your product with thermal buffers. Okay, and again, these uh, classic example. Okay, that's what I will tell you to understand the concept is let's say your product is between, has to stay between two and eight. So those buffers typically will be preconditioned at five degrees Celsius, okay? And so they can be, optimally, if you could pay for this, you will reduce like phase change the barrel at five. Okay? That means if it go up a little bit, okay, that means all that buffer has to melt, okay, before starting seeing a change in temperature, because that's where the phase change is, right? Until you have some solid material, the temperature should remain constant in that plateau where the phase change occurs. And if it goes down, so it's gonna to have to all solidify before you have sensible temperature change and the temperature starts to change. Typically it's a good idea to blanket it with those thermal buffers. If money is an option, what people do is they just use regular jump packs, five degrees Celsius, okay, and they do act as a buffer. They do not have effective as in the as in phase change was at five degrees Celsius. Obviously, do not rely on the specific box orientation. We'll discuss that. Limit shifting of the different components, that's also very important. Be aware of natural convection. Talk about this, okay? And for the testing phase, you need to test in the lab, okay? You also need to test in real shipping condition, okay? Um, and that may be looking at the spin route, okay? Or destination, okay? Look at how things are handled by your distribution system. Know where and how to measure the temperature. That is important because you may have to scrub some, scrap some material initially, but the real way to measure the temperature is really to measure the temperature of your product itself. Okay, there's no other way to do that effectively. Okay, um, and so that means if you have little vials or something, you should put a thermal couple in there, or a thermistor, or use a thermal couple on the energy to put that directly in the product, because that was done in the past that people would put the data logger in there, but I swear, if you're smart and you can play the data logger everywhere you want, you will have a, pass a package that will be successfully passing almost any test, okay? Because depending where you put that probe, it's going to be really quite different. But the important thing is the product. Uh, evaluate the results and readjust the design. That's typically what we're going to talk about many, many times, you test in the lab, you test the field, you reevaluate and you adjust, okay? 
because there's things that you can design and it will work perfectly, but in packaging systems, <coughs> usually an iteration process is required because there's so many variables. So, how do we test against what temperature? So, typically, uh, each packaging design should be tested against cold and hot or heat profile, okay? That would be representative, representative of your distribution chart. Okay, so typically you need both, okay? And sometimes you may end up with two designs, okay? One for cold condition, and one for high condition to save money because something that is built to resist everything will cost a lot more money. Um, the temperature mapping, okay? So this is where you measure the temperature of your product, okay? The temperature should, well, actually you must, but it should remain, okay, within the range any given point within the payload. So if you have a box with a hundred vial, that thing must demonstrate that each vial remains within that range. So obviously you don't want to instrument a hundred vials, but you can clearly show, okay, um, location where the vial, the little glass container will change temperature more than the other. So if you're in the middle of the bunch, typically that will be the last location to change temperature because of thermal inertia and everything surrounding. Any vials in a corner will be subject to faster temperature change because of the exposure to more surface, right? That's typically what happens. So you can change, you can show that in testing, but make sure that everything is there and it's basically testing. You can show the range that you can expect. Thermal density as well. So if the package system is used to sh ship different types of product, okay, meaning 100 vials and 10 vials, okay, sometimes you don't want to have like a bunch of different designs, you want to have as few number as possible. Um, then you need to show that it will work even if you have the lowest thermal density, meaning a little bit of product. Because again, if you have a lot of product, so that is the thermal map that needs to change to the temperature to change inside. You have a little thing, that will change that to the very fast. And the thing is, why do we need, don't want to need a lot of, you don't want a lot of different designs, is obviously if you have many designs, you need to have people packaging things differently, that's one. But typically as well, packaging systems, if you work in pharmaceutical, medical device industry, they need to be validated, okay? That means that you run all these tests in-house, okay? You documented everything, okay? Uh, you showed to the FDA or the FDA usually that your package passed all of these tests and they agreed that you would do and they approved for the design, okay? The thing is, this costs a lot of money to do that. It takes a lot of time, okay? The thing is, if you change something, you need to you do a validation, okay? And show that your new validation passes the thing. So that was one of the big issues um, in the medical industry not long ago because I need to bring you some sample of Tyvek. I told you I would do that and I did not. But um, Tyvek is used quite a lot in the medical device industry because it, it allows sterilization, okay, and it basically keeps bacteria outside, it's resistance and so on. But DuPont manufacturer Tyvek decided to change their recipe, okay, if you want. So now you had all these companies that use one material that have to revalidate everything, okay? So they work, DuPont worked with the company to try to solve the issue in the FDA, but that means if you change supplier, you need to change the validation process. So all of these things are things you need to think about. Um, and some of you may have experienced that in your employment or things like this, but it's, um, it's a thing. So in addition to Design your own packaging system, okay? You can also buy what's called pre-qualified shipper. That would be something like this, okay? That somebody sell, okay, tell you, okay, this is uh, a shipper is basically the box, okay? The whole packaging system, okay? In the industry, they call them shippers. So, um, so you can buy these already all done, okay? Particularly if you don't, have big volume you ship once in a while. That might be something you have to do, or to look at. And you have the price range here, okay? And one of the issues, particularly at the beginning, is that 
there was large discrepancies between theoretical and actual performance of the shippers. So people, there was no standard at some point how to evaluate the performance. So uh, you guys will come up with the temperature profile that you judge was right. That means the temperature profile is the temperature that changes with time, let's say over 48 hours, and you expose your product to this, okay? The whole package to this, that's how you test it. And the thing is, you can use one, I can use a different one, and then you say yours lasts for 48 hours, I can say mine lasts <coughs> 72 hours, but there was me comparing different things, right? Okay? So that was an issue. And some people were using, in a way, something that looks pretty extreme. So you can have a temperature profile. I was all going to see that, let's say you have temperature here and time. If you have something that do something like this, okay, it may look like super extreme because it goes like super hot and super low, okay? But you know what? That's pretty easy because, you know, by the time the package starts increasing temperature, then you bring it back down, okay? And you bring it back up, and you bring it back down, so things don't change much, right? Does it make sense? So uh, there was a lot of stuff like this happening. Wait, wait. Can you explain that one time? What's the so the temperature? If you have something, the temperature goes up. Like let's say four forty degrees Celsius, and it goes back down to minus ten. Mm -hmm. So your package, when it's exposed to that high temperature for a little bit, is going to start increasing. But as soon as it starts increasing, you bring it back down. So it just will try to zero it back to initial temperature. So are those two like one inside the package and one outside the constraint enclosure? Or? So, uh, yeah, okay. So that's a temperature profile. So what you will do, okay, that's the temperature. If you put in a big control temperature room, and you expose your box to this temperature to qualify, okay? And you measure the temperature of the product. That's the line I was tracing. Oh, okay, there, okay, okay. So your product temperature is basically, it's easy to maintain it if you just vary constantly between two extreme states. Oh, gotcha. But if you were to start... <coughs> Just with a temperature that drops like this, okay, and then increase back something like that can be even more challenging, okay, uh, even if it doesn't look challenging initially. So, anyways, there was a lot of differences between uh, performances. Uh, so that's what I'm going to that story a little bit later, but that's what uh, forced the industry to adopt some standards. So. Um, Again, a number of companies still use six-panel EPS solution with water-based gel pack. So that means that is the cheapest option available. So that means, remember, if you have just six panel that you put in the box, you don't have any like, anything in the middle, and you just put a bunch of water gel, so you can have a system that is will be effective, okay? Uh, but it's huge, okay? It has to be huge and it has to be heavy because you need to have a lot of these gel packs, okay, as thermal buffer, as ice, and so on. And you need to have a lot of insulation, styrofoam, because it's not a very good insulation. So you need to have thick walls. So that becomes a heavy and big box, okay? So these work very well. VIP with PCM, we talked about it a lot. Relatively low weight, but they are expensive. And some people still don't want to deal with PCM phase change material. Um, so because remember there was a lot of them that were toxic and they were leaking um, and some as well just don't want to deal with all these different temperature you need for preconditioning so it depends so that's a little bit of an eye chart I'm not going to go through all of this with you okay but ISTA I mentioned that name a few times so the International Safe Transit Association Okay, uh, created a standard, okay, which is called the standard 70, with also standard 20, okay, um, that basically created temperature profiles um, as a standard, okay, so at least everybody <coughs> has access to now this standard profile that you can uh, test your product with and compare different packaging systems to see if their performance actually is what um, it says or compare apples to apples. Right? So actually I was involved in this during all the 
the data analysis and what was decided um, is, I should have remembered because it's been so long, but I think there was about 5,000 shipments that were done uh, with this conjunction with help from UPS, so everything was um, leaving from Louisville, okay? And then it was going everywhere in the U.S. where they are large pharmaceutical centers. So we had shipment done in the summer, shipment done in the winter. Each box was actually an empty box, okay, with six data loggers. It was empty because the goal was to measure the environment, not the product. So you wanted air, basically, so it changes temperature fast, and you measure the temperature at which your load can be exposed. Um, so, again, this is not something... Because we had lanes through Alaska and Hawaii and Florida, everywhere. So you have destinations that are clearly different than the average, okay? But the idea through this was really to have something that is standard that everybody can use. Obviously, you can work with ISC and look at different lanes and create a specific lane that you have a shipment that you really want to test on a specific lane. But this temperature standard uh, you know, temperature profile looked like this. You remember, I just mentioned that this was not good. Okay, obviously, this is not as fast as the variation. What you see here is something that is typical of a summer profile where solar radiation plays a really large role into the temperature of the environment. Okay, so you see those variation that's due to the night period. Okay, so this was the that, that is the temperature profile for a 72-hour test you could use for hot temperature. And this is a cold temperature profile that we came up with. And again, in the cold temperature profile, what you see is <clears throat> you don't have this cyclical behavior as well because solar radiation in the winter time is not as dominant. Okay? Uh, and what also can be added to this, a lot of pharmaceutical companies add big spikes in temperature, okay? So somewhere in there, usually around that stage, you can add a big spike, okay, that would go down to the minus 10 or even below to simulate a, I would say, critical event that can happen, okay? The package is left outside for an hour, and it's really cold, or it's a stored for a few hours near a garage door, something like this. Uh, which you actually see on individual shipment quite often, uh, but these can be added as well. But these are temperature standards, um, and the thing I'm going to try to work on this, and you, hopefully you're going to be exposed to this by the end of the semester, is that as engineers, most of you are engineers, um, I think, what you will see is that you will have to read and apply those standards procedures quite a lot. Any of you had to work with standards uh, as a work internship? Can you guys raise your hand? Yeah. So what what field was that? Okay. Was that an ASTM standard or something like this? Yeah. Okay. But anyways, um, I I like to warn you a little bit because some, when I ask you to read these things a little later in the semester. It's really boring, okay. <laughs> and it's really dry, okay. It's just step by step definition. It's better than I would say. Um, um, I would say lawyer uh, language, okay. But it's really dry. But it's very important as graduate engineer that you are able to focus and then you go to the thing and understand them. And actually, one of the students that took my class last year, um, I think I can say she complained a little bit about the class, but she got an internship, and that's all she does on the standards mm -hmm. and apply these, okay? And she said that was very important, okay? So I'm telling you, sometimes in life, that can be when you buy a house or buy a car or in your work, you're going to have to read terrible stuff that is boring to death, okay? You have to do it as well, okay? So uh, get ready for this. It happens, okay? Sometimes you have to read 30 homework assignments that actually are almost identical to each other <laughs> for a long time. It's not the most fun thing as well. 
Um, so that's a little bit uh, of an overview of shipment of pharmaceutical products. Uh, and I will try to get one of the speakers a little bit later in the semester. I'll try to get some speaker. We have people from the glass institute that are going to come for shipment of glass packaging. We also I'll try to get someone from a uh, company called Delta Track that do data logger, but he worked a lot in the medical industry, pharmaceutical industry. Uh, so I, I like to bring him here to talk about cold chain and distribution center. And to prove to you that what I'm telling you is mostly true. <laughs> <laughs> or at least relevant, okay? So, um, good. So right now I'm gonna shift here, okay, quite a lot. So we talked, at this point, my goal with all these slides we talked about was to obviously give you an overview of what distribution and transport packaging is, okay? And also open your mind to, you should know your product. And also you should know your product. That's what we talked about. We looked at the mode of, different mode of transportation, what were the characteristics, what kind of temperature control there is, what kind of temperature variation you can get, how things are handled, forklift, and all that stuff. Ballots. So we learned a lot of things, okay? Hopefully, actually, yeah. We talked about a lot of things. Hopefully, you learned a lot of things, and we, you will learn a lot of things as we process through this. The next step, what we want to go through, okay, is start talking about vibration, okay, first, and then shock. So to do this, um, we're going to go to a little bit more of a mathematical and physical subject, okay? So one thing you need to realize as well is that there is a lot of variation in the packaging industry due to unknown, I should say, due to unknown during distribution, okay? And a lot of variability in how things are packed, okay? And loaded in trailer and things like this. So hopefully uh, you understand that to make use of these basic physics concepts, we need to keep it simple, right? So you cannot go and make and go in great detail for each and out. So what we're trying to do here is try to make use of relatively simple physics concepts with a lot of assumptions, okay? But in the end, our goal is to give us some tools, okay, to be able to guide our design, okay? Either to protect against vibration, okay, or to protect against shock. So it's more efficient. Obviously, you cannot predict and I would not think it's rational to get an analysis such in detail that you know exactly what happened in one box because there's going to be so much variation. But the idea is to generally get some tools based on physical principle that will allow to do this. So keep in mind, some of you, I don't know, do you have a lot of mechanical engineers here? One? Okay. So in chemistry, chemical engineering, I don't think you do a lot of stuff, okay? Mechanical or chemical? Chemical. So you might have seen some of that stuff in basic physics, but you may have wanted to push it out of your memory if you didn't like it too much, okay? So uh, some of these things I'm going to bring back, and oftentimes in this class, I also sometimes have proud students from different backgrounds, so I go through a review of everything, okay? So uh, let me know if I go too slow or too fast. I'll try to adjust. But I have one series of slides about an introduction to some of these basic concepts, and then I'm going to go on the board and start writing, okay? Uh, hopefully, uh, I'll try to prepare you as well. Initially, I have a lot of definition, okay? And not only like me writing paragraphs, but meaning it will be a little bit dry because I'm going to present a concept, explain what it is, go to another concept, and explain what it is, and hopefully together after this we can put it all together and make use of it. Does it make sense? Yes. Uh, is this stuff going to be in test one still? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that stuff for test one, you'll see it's going to be uh, more of a problem. So you're going to have a problem to solve. Okay. So that will be not a lot of things you have to remember by heart, but it's really application of some concept. So, uh, this is introduction or an introduction to packaging dynamics, okay? What are the hazards in the distribution? We talked about this already a little bit. Manual handling has come to the top of the list because when people handle these things, they will make 
stupid decision, okay, or they will make mistakes, things will be dropped, things will be thrown, okay, um, things will be stepped on, things like this, so it's a hazard. Uh, handling equipment, loading and unloading operation, that obviously is associated with manual handling. Conveyors, we just mentioned today, things are often slipped on these conveyors. Uh, vehicle impact and vibration, so this is what we're going to talk about. So vibration is pretty much associated with road transportation, this is where you have a lot of vibration, but if you have some things on the on the road, a pothole or something like this, you can have in addition to this impacts. Okay, due to the vibration movement, but you can also have vibration that is so much that you can have a box that falls off. So uh, it's an impact as well due to the vibration. So obviously, we also mentioned this. So packaging system, uh, the packaging system. My goodness, what is this? Why do they run? Okay, so that's made, I'm missing an A there, sorry about this. The packaging design may be designed, the packaging system may be designed to minimize the damage associated with the distribution environment, but sometimes, again, that's something we talked about, I think the first section of the semester, the product must be redesigned in order to survive, okay? Otherwise, your cost for packaging system is just going to be too much. Fundamental concepts, okay? So... Speed, okay, the measure of distance over a moving object, okay, uh, by a moving object over a unit of time. Velocity, okay, is a combination of both speed and direction. It's a vector, okay, it has an x, y, and z component, okay, if you're talking rectangular coordinates. And then acceleration is a measure of the rate at which the velocity change with respect to time. It's also a vector. If you know that, so you know that acceleration is dv dt, okay? So you also need to understand that you can have acceleration even if you're going at constant speed. But if you're changing direction, you get an acceleration, okay? So these are some basic concepts. We're going to use Newton's second law of motion quite a lot, F equals ma. So force equals mass on acceleration, you know this. The acceleration we're going to deal with a lot of times will be gravitational acceleration, partially when we're going to deal with free-falling objects, okay? When you're dealing with a drop, that's gravitational acceleration. I'll give you here gravitational acceleration in different units that we may use. As engineers, you should be really good with units, okay? So you have here a little summary. If you haven't done this in a long time, velocity length over time, acceleration over the time square, and so on. Frequency, we're going to talk quite a lot about it as well. It's the inverse of the period. So units of frequency, frequency of one over a second, or hertz, okay, which is the same thing. We're going to talk about this. Force, let me see. If you look at this equation, it's mass times acceleration. So that's what you have here. Energy will be a force over a certain distance, okay? So that will be, this will be Newton's if you want. Energy will be Newton meters. What's the other units for Newton meter? Joule. Joule, very good, okay? You guys are on top of this. Constant acceleration. So if you're dealing with a free falling object, you have a constant acceleration. That means that if you look at the velocity change with time, it's going to be a linear behavior. Okay? And the slope of this variation is going to be given or linked to the acceleration. Okay? Because acceleration is dv dt. Pretty straightforward. From this analysis, okay, you can come up with the, some equation for uh, basic mathematics of motion that links second velocity, the velocity, final velocity after a certain acceleration for a certain amount of time, average velocity, you can look at the position as a function of time based on an average velocity, and so on. So all of these you can probably derive yourself, okay? Uh, so we're going to use some of these a little bit, and initially we're going to establish one thing is for free-falling package. We're going to need that 
impact velocity quite a lot, and that's the first thing we're going to derive. Okay, so that's what is mentioned here. A critical parameter, particularly for cushion design. So when you need cushioning in your uh, packaging system, is the impact velocity, okay, which is directly related to the product or package damage. Okay, very important. So if you look. If you start with a free-falling object, what you know is that the initial velocity is zero, and the, the acceleration is equal to the gravitational acceleration. So, if I do that simple analysis, okay, something like this, you have your package at the top, <coughs> certain height, okay, and you have the x-axis oriented downwards, and you have the package that falls. It started at velocity zero. That means People are not throwing the package, it just drops, okay? So what you are after is what would be the impact velocity at which velocity this package is going to hit the ground. So we can go through this relatively quickly, okay? Um, if you see the equation from the previous page, okay, you know that the difference between x2 and x1 are x is actually the drop height, which is more important for us than just x2 and x1. So we're going to use that difference at the height like this. From here, okay, you can find the time it will take for your package from the point of departure, okay, of the height until it hits the ground. So that's the equation of star. You can go through this if you want. So what we do now is we obviously we realize that the final velocity is what we call the impact velocity. Using that equation, plugging delta t from the equation we derived earlier, we find that this would be the equation <coughs> of what we call the impact velocity. So V sub i is equal to square root of 2gh. Okay? So what can we learn from this expression? Okay? So as engineers, you should not take each of these equations blindly. You should try to make sense physically of what happened, and what it means for you or for the package that's going to be falling. So obviously, you see that the impact velocity will increase with the drop height. That makes total sense. But one thing we notice, it's not proportional directly to the drop height. It's proportional to the square root of the drop height. Okay? That's one thing we need to understand. So the impact velocity we're going to use quite a lot a little bit later when we're going to be dealing with shocks. Okay? So for a little while, we're going to put that aside, okay? But we're going to come back to it a little bit later. The thing to remember here is it's going to be square root of 2gh. And here you have the origin of this guy. Okay, so that was a very quick series of slides, um, which I basically decided to do because instead of doing that on the board, I thought it would be a lot quicker this way. So let me... Put that up here. Um, let's see. Try to get here some of the lights. Vibration. Okay. Um, I'm going to try to write as good as I can. Okay. Let me know if there's a word you cannot read. I'll be happy to correct it for you. Uh, let you know what I mean. So, first thing here, okay, is you have to realize that. Mechanical vibrations are associated with changes. Acceleration 
It's still underlined where it ties. I'm sorry? Vibration. Vibration. That, that starts well, right? So it's in the changes in acceleration and also dynamic compression. I'll show you a quick video on this that I picked on Friday. That may lead to mechanical advantage. Changes in acceleration are typically one of the big causes. And what is dynamic compression? Okay, obviously if you understand the concept of compression. If I have a, bunch, a load of boxes, they stack on top of each other because of their weight. They have compression. So now, if you have this thing shaking up, okay, what you have is that this compression becomes dynamic. So it becomes less, it goes more intensive depending of the movement of the box and the movement of the floor. Okay, so that's very important. And we'll see as well that, uh, as you can imagine, so classic physics, so if you talk about vibration, you can have a pendulum, okay? Uh, you also oftentimes use a spring, okay, in mass system. Obviously, for packaging application, a pendulum is not very interesting, so we're going to use a spring and mass system for most of our analysis. And obviously, one thing you will see and realize is that those boxes, okay, corrugated or everything, okay, they're going to act basically as springs, okay, they're going to have certain stiffness, okay, and each individual will have their own characteristic, but when you put them on a pallet as all together, they're also going to have certain characteristic and certain compression, and they basically act like springs, so that's why it's pretty important to test them in the lab, but also the spring and mass system is going to be kind of our bread and butter for our analysis. So, um, the next thing here, this is just a quick introduction, okay? So, basic concepts again. Okay, first thing we're going to talk here about, I should put this here, simple. Harmonic motion. So we're going to use, as I just mentioned, a spring mass system. Okay. Um, we're going to have to do some assumptions <coughs> for our analysis. Okay, so we're going to assume that our system first is frictionless, no loss of energy to friction, uh, and also assume that we have a, an ideal spring system. Spring. So that means as well, um, if you Set the system into motion, it's going to vibrate forever and ever. You will have no loss in due to deformation in the spring, and you will also have kind of a linear behavior again with the force. It's going to follow Hooke's law. Um, and lastly, we're going to collect gravity in the direction of. So we're going to have it going horizontally. Collect gravity in the direction of linear gravity. So um, just a quick reminder. Okay. Okay. So 
So for the force exerted, exerted by a spring, okay, you use Hooke's law, okay, which links the spring constant, which is related to its stiffness, to a displacement. And obviously you have a negative sign here because the force is exerted in the opposite direction of the displacement. Okay? So that means let me try to do that nicely here as well. Uh, I'm not gonna have time to do that schematic and finish it on time for you. So I'm going to stop here for today. I know I'll let you right there on the edge just introducing the flow and then uh, I'm going to have to do that. So um, good luck at the uh, career showcase.